right, buenos dias mis amigos. All right, today I'm going to show you in the Bible where we can find the Antichrist. And then I'm going to make it easy for you to see who the Antichrist is today. All right, now before I get into that, I want to just go over a couple of comments here. Um, Guts Freedom. He says, does Asia play zero role in all of this? Referring to the end times and they don't play any role whatsoever. All right, no matter how many people repeat the same thing, doesn't make it true. There is no um, Bible prophecy that is relevant to to this idea that Asia is playing a role, Russia is playing a role, China is playing a role, United States playing a role, as if war was the end of the world. Jesus specifically says you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Be ye not troubled. These things must first take place, but the end is not yet. Okay? The end... The end of the world is what Jesus says is that the gospel must first be preached in all the world then shall the end come and he says except those days be shortened there should no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man now first of all in the days of Noah there was only eight souls saved Okay, and then the other part of that is they were not expecting the end of the world to come at all, and it came quick. All right, so also are we in a world that people don't realize there are very few people saved? A lot of people claiming to be Christians, but they're not of God. All right, so. Uh, let's continue here. And Brett Favre, he says, um, Brother, if you could go over to the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church, that would be amazing. All right, so I'm going to do that here in a second. I appreciate this comment from Roderick. He says that current nation is a Roman creation. Uh, talking about Israel. All right, and that again, it, it sounds biblical, but it's not. And our holy city of God is in heaven. It's not over there in the Middle East. All right, now Karen Ann Lopez um, uh, shares a video with me, so I want to go over that. About 40 seconds or so. Let's listen. And this is the formula that I used from a gentleman who claimed to be a preterist as a primer when teaching New Testament Bible prophecy. When reading the New Testament, just pretend that you're reading an actual true story. And that when the text clearly describes that someone is standing there looking someone in the eyes, talking directly to them, just pretend that they were actually talking to the actual person or people the verse actually records that they were actually talking to, especially if they keep using the word you while looking at them and talking directly to them. Then simply pretend that whatever they were being told was actually relevant to the actual person that it was actually being told to. All right, so uh, the, that's an obvious problem. If you do that, then you're setting yourself up to be deceived. And it's absolutely ridiculous to make that uh, viewpoint. That, oh, okay, so what, what she's saying is when in Matthew... Oops, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, which is the context of what she's saying. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Okay, so when Jesus is speaking to them, what these people claim is that he was only speaking to them that were in front of him. And so basically just ignore you know it's, it's not for you it's it was for them thousands of years ago that, so that's i mean that is pure evil to teach that it's nonsensical and it will only 
um, fool those that do not know the Bible. Okay, so if you don't know the Bible, you might, heck, I don't know, that might be true, right? But when you know the Bible, you know that's absolutely not true at all. And, I mean, this is what I mean when I, I maybe you've heard me say, I can see the wizards behind closed curtains. They're not fooling me. Okay, I can see these deceivers and the tricks that they play. Now, in Mark 13, now first of all, this is my Facebook. I mean, I've had this for years. And this is why I have this on my Facebook, is because this is such a huge statement that our Lord Jesus Christ makes. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Okay? And so that's very important, man. Very, very important. He's not just talking to them in front of them. He's talking to every single person who has ever lived. All right? Now, <laughs> you ought to know that it is appointed unto man once to die, and then after this, the judgment. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, who's going to stand in front of him? Everybody. Everybody. So when this word right here, when he says all, what I say unto you, I say unto all, all means all all uh, <laughs> there's no well there's some, it doesn't mean some it means all <laughs> couldn't be there's not another word that could be more direct than all what jesus says to you or to them he says to all and then he says watch and so that's what uh, it's so powerful it's incredible all right so in reference to the end of the world is coming and no matter what sort of silly games you want to play here it's not going to change the truth in fact it, it's almost as though this is going along with exactly what Jesus is teaching. Is, that is, that you know, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Those, you know, people say they believe in Christ, but they are deceivers. They outwardly they appear to be one of us, but inwardly they are not of us at all all right and so the world is full of those kinds of people right now and of course in mark uh, 13 verse 20 except that the lord had shortened those days no flesh should be saved but for the elect's sake whom he has chosen he has shortened the days this can only mean that as we get closer to the end of the world there are fewer and fewer people saved and more and more people deceived. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the world today. And so don't fall for this idea that Jesus was only talking to those people at that time. And I, I could really get into this. You know, I could turn this into an hour. You know, for example, uh, um, you know, um, there's well, this whole thing, this whole doctrine of preterism, it, it's ridiculous. And I don't want to get into it. But it, it's, it's not a new concept. It's an age-old form of deception. 2 Timothy 2, verse 18, who concerning the earth, uh, who concerning the truth have erred, 
saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So the idea of preterism is that everything's already taken place. There's nothing to see here. Just go on. Uh, it's stupid. There's really not a nice way to put it. All right, so let's move on to uh, this uh, request by Brett Favre, former quarterback for the Green Bay Packers and the New York Jets. Let's see if we can help this fella here. All right, and I want to help you all. So let's start off by just typing in the word Antichrist. All right, so in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John writes, he says, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrist, whereby we know that it is the last time. All right, so th this is in reference to the Antichrist that is uh, prophesied, uh, you know, essentially all throughout the Bible, but, uh, you know, specifically uh, Daniel, and um, so that's what I'm going to get into is, is the book of Daniel. I'm going to look, I'm going to show you in the book of Daniel the Antichrist, and then I'm going to show you in the New Testament as well. All right, and so let's start off. Let's start off um, in First uh, Thessalonians. What is that? And for in Second Thessalonians chapter two, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now this is clearly. Uh, in reference to the Antichrist that is being, you know, that is talked about in First John chapter 2, that is talked about in the book of Daniel. All right, so we're going to start connecting some dots here. All right, so uh, in Second Thessalonians it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. All right, so now I already read for you in Mark 13 about how um, there was, uh, except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. So we're inching closer to a time if God allowed things to play out as they are playing out now, there would come a time when there would be nobody saved. But for the elect's sake, God will shorten those days. So the deceivers are growing more and more each and every day. Meaning there are only there are fewer and fewer people being saved every day. Just as it was in the days of Noah, there's only eight souls that were saved. So also in the coming of the Son of Man, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, there will be very few people saved. And because of this growing deception in the world... Now, the Antichrist is gaining in power because people don't recognize him. You know, they were able to see him more clearly, more easily, 50, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. They, people are, today don't see him as easily because there are so many people deceived. And it's growing, it's growing. So because the deception is growing, his power is growing. Make sense? Okay. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, right? So, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now we have a parallel verse in the book of Daniel. 
Okay. Give me a second while I think about the wording of that. Right there it is, Daniel 11. Okay, so we're going to read this verse for you. In Daniel chapter 11. Now, the context of this is Daniel is talking about four kings that shall arise out of the earth. Four kings, which are four uh, kingdoms, which he describes as beast. Let me show you real quick. In Daniel 7, verse 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now, these are four kingdoms that shall arise out of the earth. And then, of course, he talks about the fifth kingdom that um, is an everlasting kingdom. Okay, so there's he. what he describes is that there are four kingdoms until the end of the world, and then the fifth kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. Now, Daniel is 12 chapters long. It might take 5 minutes to read one chapter. 5 times 12 is 60. So it can take an hour, if you read slow, like me, to read the book of Daniel. I highly encourage you to read it. And it should be pretty clear. I mean, unless you're trying to fit what you're reading in with what Reverend Smitty says, it can be difficult. But when you read it and believe that these are the words from God, directly from God, and then it, it, you know, it should make pretty good sense. It really should. And so Daniel, he names the first three of the four beasts. The first beast is the uh, king of Babylon, the Babylonian Empire. The second beast is the Medes and the Persians. The third beast is the Greek Empire. All right. Now he does not name the fourth beast because the fourth beast had not come as the time that he had written it. But we can figure out who the fourth beast is in the New Testament. Now I'll get to that in a second. Now this is important to understand the context because he's talking about the fourth beast. Okay? In here in Daniel 11. And when he okay, so in verse 36 it says and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done now let's first of all draw a parallel here and he shall magnify himself i'm sorry and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god so in second thessalonians 2 it says who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called god all right so we're able to draw a line here make a connection from this to that and we know that this is um, talking about the same thing all right okay so that's important so uh, we can see who today opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Well, it would have to be somebody that calls himself God. And another, another term for God would be the Holy Father. Right? It's interesting. Oh, let's do it this way. Make it easier. 
one time, one time in the entire Bible, Holy Father is mentioned. Um, the term or phrase or have whatever the Holy Father is mentioned one time in John chapter 17 and it's Jesus saying Holy Father keep through thine own name those whom thou has given me that they may be one as we are referring to God Almighty all right now of course Jesus is God Almighty but as he spoke this he was in our body so he leads by example okay it's nothing too complicated now this term Holy Father means God Almighty so if you're calling yourself the Holy Father you're exalting yourself as God all right and of course Jesus says Call no man father. All right. You know where I'm going with this, but just bear with me. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. All right. So there is no God. Um, how do I say this? The God is in heaven. There's no God on earth that is one man who represents God. Okay. <laughs> you ought to be very sus suspicious if there's any man on earth who pretends to be the representative of God and only him. All right. So let's take a look at something here. All right. You think about who created heaven and earth. Well, it's God Almighty, right? God Almighty. So I want to share a verse with you. Um, uh oh, I gotta, I gotta think about it. Okay. Give me a second here. Uh, it's been a little bit since I've done this, so you'll have to bear with me. I'll find it, though. All right, there we go. The O Lord God of Israel. All right. O Lord God of Israel. There, that's the verse I was looking for. That, that basically says the same thing. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Isaiah 37. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God. Even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Speaking of God Almighty. Now, if there's a man pretending to be this, know you that this is not God, all right? And so think about that. O oh, Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, Thou art God. Now, look at this image right here. All right. You know who that is, right? You know what these are? Cherubims. That's a chair. All right. Think about this. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between, that dwells between the cherubims. All right, let's go to Second Thessalonians. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Daniel 11. 
and the king, the fourth be, shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Now we could really get into this and get into how the Roman Catholic Church claims to be the mother of all churches and the universal church of all the religions of the world. Okay? But I don't think it's necessary. I really don't. I want to stick with what the Bible says. Okay? Now, this is incredible how obvious this is to me. Right, but I want to help those who are not as clear about this. Now also in Daniel 11, it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. Now, I want you to think about this. They call this guy the Pope. Alright? Pope means Holy Father. He is exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worship. The title alone suggests that. Now, they, he also calls himself the vicar of Christ, the representative of Jesus Christ on earth. And uh, once again, exalting himself as the representative. Not as a representative, but as the representative. Huge difference. Now, also consider this nor the desire of women. Neither shall he have the desire of women. Have you ever heard of a Mrs. Pope? Think about it. Think about it. Now, let's go back to Daniel 7. Alright, let's do it this way. Let's go back to Daniel 7. This is crucial because once you understand this foundation of four beasts and four kingdoms, alright, then you ought to be able to see who the fourth beast is and now you can start making connections with the fourth beast of the Bible with the world that we're in right now. Okay. Now, we have to be in this fourth beast of Daniel. There's no wiggle room. All right. We are no longer in the Greek Empire. Right? And after the Greek Empire came the Roman Empire. You can't wiggle around that. Now, after the Roman Empire, or after the fourth beast, the fourth kingdom, then is the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is established forever, which is set up forever, which is... Um, after the fourth kingdom. We are not in that fifth kingdom right now. Not at all. This world comes to an end after this fourth kingdom is destroyed. Now, let's um, try to figure out who the fourth kingdom is. So, uh, if you understand the book of Daniel, you know that he names the first three kingdoms. Alright, and then... So there's a couple of ways we can do this here to figure out who the fourth kingdom is. Now we... You have... 
look, we have to be in this fourth kingdom. There's just no wiggle room around it. You can, you know, ignore it if you don't understand it, but it's not going to do you any good to ignore it. It's going to help you a whole bunch to understand it. Because once you understand we are in that fourth kingdom of Daniel, and then you start making connecting the dots here in the New Testament, everything falls into place. Now, in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, again, this word all, it means all. Not some, not part, all. All means all. Alright, so just from this verse alone, we can deduce that the Roman Empire is the fourth beast of Daniel. When the Roman Empire is destroyed forever, then it's the end of the world. It's destroyed forever at the end of the world. All right, now this, that's what Daniel talks about. That's what he's prophesying is about the end of the world. Make no mistake about it. Of course, if you've read it, you ought to know it. You ought to understand it pretty simply. It's not rocket science. It's rather simple. When it becomes complicated is when you try to connect what Daniel writes with what false teachers teach makes it very very difficult to understand understandably so but when you read it in a very with a very simple mindset that hey this is the words from God it's it, it really is very simple in Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 he says many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. What he's referring to is the end of the world. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then after this, the judgment. The judgment of God is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, and there is this great separation that takes place. The saved from the unsaved, the sheep from the goat, the wheat from the tares. All right, and then the wrath of God is poured upon the wicked. This is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. And this is what Daniel is talking about with the four beasts, the four kingdoms. And then comes the end of the world. All right, so let me see if I can find that verse just to make it real easy. No, no it's the end. Here, let me do it this way. Let me try to do it this way. Ouch. Okay. Um, I'm going to scroll down here. Let's see. That's got to be it, right? But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to, to consume and destroy unto the end. So he's talking about the end of the world. Alright, so, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. Alright, now, uh, this is, if you, if you read it and understand it, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. Alright, even to the time of the end. Daniel's talking about the end of the world, at the end of this world that we're in. Alright, and of course he's talking about, uh, the four beasts, the four kingdoms, after the end, you know, the when the end of the world comes, it's the end of the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom is destroyed at the end of the world. Okay, I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I really can't. Because that you have to understand that. Alright? Now, I just showed you one verse that shows the Roman Empire has to be the fourth kingdom kingdom the end of the world has not yet come therefore the roman empire has to be the beast of revelation you can't get around it 
there is not a fifth beast before the end of the world. All right. And so there's just no wiggle room. There's no way to wiggle around it. The fourth kingdom of Daniel has to be the Roman Empire. There's another clue here that we can uh, look at here. And we can see, oops, what am I looking at here? Let's go this way. All right. And a superscription also was written over him, Jesus, in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. All right. The Greek was the old empire. The Latin was the current empire. And, of course, the Hebrew was the old empire. And the superscription read, this is the king of the Jews. All right. Now, that's another clue, all right, because Greek being an old empire and the Hebrew, which if you wanted to make a connection to the Babylonian empire, fine. That's not really uh, what this verse is about. But nevertheless, what's what's new is this. Uh, or what, what's interesting is the this uh, new uh, language or new tongue that is introduced and that is the Latin it's more evidence that the Roman Empire is the fourth kingdom of Daniel should be no question about it all right like I showed you in Luke chapter 2 the Caesar Augustus had the power to tax the whole world now since we're on this, let's go let's do it this way in Isaiah 14 there's a proverb against the king of Babylon remember the king of Babylon represents the first of the four beasts that's important to understand because all four beasts are of the same spirit all right now of this first beast this first kingdom there's a proverb against the king of babylon all right and as we read this proverb we see that here in verse 12 how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of of the clouds I will be like the most high now this is also parallel with 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 and um, and then also what we read in Daniel 11 who opposes and exalts himself above all well oh, that is called God or that is worship so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Again, he exalts his throne above all that is called God. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. All right, so this, again, is parallel with everything that we're reading in regards to the fourth kingdom, which is the fourth beast, which is the Antichrist that John refers to and is the beast of Revelation. All right, again, there cannot be anybody else. They can't refer to anybody else but the fourth beast of Daniel. All right. Alright, so again, 
Now, we've made the connection here. We connect the, the dots from Isaiah 14 to 2 Thessalonians 2 to Daniel 11. All right, we could do more, but let's look at this word, Lucifer. Isn't that interesting? You know what Lucifer it's the only time in the entire Bible that word is mentioned. All right, so if we did a search for Lucifer, you're only going to find this word one time. It's, an, it's, it's an crazy, really, because people write books, they make movies, they write songs about Lucifer. Yet this is only mentioned one time. In the entire Bible and it's a proverb concerning the king of Babylon it's crazy nevertheless let's take a closer look at this you know and it's interesting if you don't mind here let's go to first Peter something somewhere in the Bible and second Peter Three. I was way off. Okay. Second Peter 3. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. See, God can see a thousand years of time as though it was just one day. So also can God see one day as though it were a thousand years. He can take a magnifying glass and just examine frame by frame if you will everything uh, he can do it in reverse as well so I mean it's just amazing so let's do that let's sort of do that and just sort of pause the video and look at this word you know let's stop time slow down time and look at this word Lucifer now it's interesting because as I showed you in Luke 23 the superscription that was written over Jesus this is the king of Jews it was written in Latin which was the language of that time when the Romans ruled the world that's important that's important to know it's important to understand now let's focus on this the Romans rule the world okay and their language is the Latin language here in Isaiah 14 we have a Latin word used in the proverb concerning the king of Babylon it's important it's important to see that now let's go to Revelation 17 and it's talking about the beast and it's talking about the great whore okay the great whore and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me come hither I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters now again this is also important uh, to understand the book of Revelation when these angels these angels are sent by Jesus to John to show John things which must shortly come to pass so John is showing us these things okay and again this is another vision that is being shown to John of something that is taking place and that is going to take place all right now As we read this here in verse 5, it says, a speaking of the great whore, 
Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Written on her forehead, Babylon the Great. And here in Isaiah, Chapter 14, a proverb against the king of Babylon. All right. And so in the spirit of Babylon, when Daniel talks about the four beasts, the four kings until the end of the world, the fourth kingdom is in the spirit of the first kingdom, which is the Babylonian Empire. So when we read here in Isaiah 14 and we read this Latin word this is a clue also for who the fourth beast is there so there should really should be no mistake at all that this fourth beast of Daniel is the beast spoken of in the book of Revelation and this great horror is directly connected to this beast of Revelation and the fourth beast of Daniel and the proverb against the king of Babylon, which is called Lucifer. All right, you see all the connections here, right? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will send into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will ascend above the heights of the cloud I will be like the most high who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God now it's interesting wording here the great whore now what could this mean now this vision uh, in a way it's like a puzzle okay all right so the angels are showing us a little puzzle here that we can figure out it's interesting it really is it's very interesting so in this vision these angels are showing us the great whore that sits upon many waters. Okay, so as we dissect this, we see that the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is all over the world in every country, in every tongue. And that fits exactly with what we're reading here about the great whore, isn't it? Now hold on. Before you have a spell and pass out, I want you to consider this. Verse 10, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. This is talking about a succession of kings. All right, and what do we see in the Roman Catholic Church? A succession of kings, one pope after the other. And that's all this is referring to. Okay? Now, here in verse 8, it's talking about the beast that thou sawest. I'm sorry, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Right? We... Remember that word perdition, the son of perdition? All right, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. All right, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold... The beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, remember what I said earlier. The fourth beast of Daniel has to be the Roman Empire. 
Well, where about the whole Roman Empire collapsed 1,700 years ago? Well, did it? The beast that was and is not. They're talking about the fourth beast, which was the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire that was and is not. And yet is. This is amazing, really. The Roman Empire went from a physical empire and transitioned or transformed itself into a spiritual empire. And that's exactly what Revelation 17 is talking about. The great whore. Now think about this. The bride of Christ is the are the people of God. Right? The bride, the wife of God. Think about it this way. There's a wife, and then there is the prostitute or the hooker. And the hooker or the great whore performs the duty of a wife, but she is not the wife. Okay, that's why it's referred to as the great whore. These, this is not the religion of God. This is a, a, a substitute, a false, a fake wife or a fake bride. However you want to look at it, it is not the true bride of Christ. Right, that's why it's referred to as a woman, not just a woman, but as the great whore that sits upon many waters. And the waters which thou sawest, where the, where the whore sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Alright, you see that? Now once you see this, the basic stuff here... Everything else will fall into place. Alright. So the beast that was. Was the physical empire. The Roman empire. And is not and yet is. Is the transformation of the Roman empire. Into the Roman Catholic church. Alright. And it, it's all there. It's all there. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And that great city, of course, is Vatican City. And you know that there is only one country in the entire world that speaks Latin as its native tongue. Yeah, you guessed it. It's Vatican City. It's incredible, huh? It's incredible how obvious it is. It really is. But nobody seems, I mean, very few people can see it because that's the way it's supposed to be. Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So obviously, there's only going to be very few people who are going to have the eyes to see this. All right. But. Man, though, for those of us that have eyes to see, this is so obvious. It's amazing, really. Another uh, interesting verse here. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And of course, this fits with everything that we're seeing uh, not just from Vatican City, but from really from the Roman Catholic churches all around the world. It's incredible, you know, what they've done and the image that they have set for themselves. You look at the Roman cathedrals all around the world, incredible structures, uh, just amazing stuff. And I wondered with great admiration. It's, uh, you know, really, 
It's incredible what these people have accomplished, but they are not of us. All right, don't forget that. Um, so, um, I, you know, I, I think I've gone on too long here, but uh, hopefully uh, maybe I'm helping somebody to see something, right? And, uh, you know, if there's something, you know, obviously, if there's something more that you'd like me to talk about specifically, please let me know. I will, I will not shy away from anything. It's pretty obvious all throughout the scripture that the world is coming to an end. Yeah, yeah. And of all the creation of the world, it looks for this moment in time when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And um, so, so also when Daniel talks about the four kingdoms when the fourth kingdom comes to an end it is the end of the world and believe me the end of the world has not yet happened okay but it's going to and when it does happen there will be no more opportunity for the unsaved to get saved Therefore, it is very important that we teach the gospel now, all right, and plant those seeds of truth that there might be an opportunity there for somebody who is seeking the truth, and let the Spirit take it from there, okay? Um, because it's quite clear to me, in my opinion, that we are getting very, very close to the end of the world. And like I mentioned earlier, when the end of the world came in Noah's time, when God flooded the entire world, there were only eight souls that were saved. Now, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, will there even be eight souls saved? You think about the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, there wasn't even ten righteous in those cities. Now when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, and he will come quickly. Nevertheless, when he comes, shall he find faith on the earth? That's an incredible question to ask. It really is. Yeah, think about it. 